Hi, this is Mark Vienen with Smart Tech Research. I'm here with Durga Malati, who is the SVP of Technology at Qualcomm. Did I get your title right, Durga? SVP and GM of Technology and Planning. There you go, there you go. I'm at this fascinating session that Qualcomm has asked me to join around all of the incredible things that um, Qualcomm is doing around AI, and they, they've been on an amazing run, I think, as most people know, uh, especially over the last, last couple of weeks, they've uh, announced a whole new slew of Copilot Plus PC, uh, PCs with their Snapdragon Elite, uh, uh, Elite technology, uh, which is amazing, but more about that later. The one topic, Durga, that I want to talk to you about, and you talked to, to us about it this morning, and so little, so few companies are, are placing emphasis on this, and Qualcomm has been talking about this for a long time, is AI is great, it's got tremendous benefits, it's efficiency, productivity, I don't think that's a, a secret to anyone, but the real question I have for you is around what the industry needs to be doing and what Qualcomm is doing around security and privacy. with Because with all the things that I think people perceive as humongous benefits with AI, there is nefarious applications of, of, of AI technology, whether it's deep fakes and there's other things that are associated with that. So let's talk a little bit about that um, and uh, maybe give me a little bit of the color of um, Qualcomm's stance in this and what they're really doing about it. Okay, so I'm going to actually touch upon a couple of points associated with it. One is, uh, yeah, we talked quite extensively about uh, the benefits of on-device AI. From a performance standpoint, you know, uh, I think it's quite obvious that if you can run AI workloads <coughs> locally, directly on-device, clearly the immediacy or the latency of the response is much better. So the mm -hmm. user experience happens to be much better. I don't think there's any uh, contest on that one at all. But I think the important aspect is that increasingly there is... Uh, uh, a consumer demand for a far more personalized AI experience. And when you kind of think through what does personalized AI experience even mean, it's a combination of two things. One, in addition to using some of the large uh, generative AI models, which are really trained on public domain information mm -hmm. by and large, uh, you want to actually contextualize the responses using local data, data that is uh, uh, possibly right on the device itself. And we talked about uh, these are healthcare applications to something else that you could be storing locally, sensory information, location information, and whatnot. And when you start putting it all together from a privacy perspective, uh, if you are interested in a personalized AI experience, uh, then uh, providing that local context and the fact that you have to tap into the local data does make people a little nervous. Yes. And if you can actually pull it off by running it on the device, that is, that's one thing that you can be comfortable about and saying, oh yeah, I don't have a problem with it. As an example, you can uh, pick up your phone or your laptop and say, when was the last time I had my physical, my doctor's appointment? Taps into local data, and I feel comfortable with the fact that it's stored locally, it's not uh, something that you have to go uh, into the cloud. Uh, the other part is, um, a second aspect, which is uh, associated with when you start thinking in terms of trust in AI systems, one of the questions that has come up recently is, uh, how do we know that the content is actually genuine? And when you parse that statement, I mean, there's, there's uh, combinations of what, what is called as a deep fake. That's a loaded, versus, yeah, it's a lo it's a pretty, lo loaded statement. It's a, it's a pretty uh, broad range of things, but bottom line is, there are, you know, broadly speaking, three kinds of content. There's content that is, you just, it's authentic, as in you took a picture, as an example, and maybe you touched it up a little bit, but basically it's the same picture, not, no changes. And then you have a picture that you took and maybe augmented it, um, creating uh, in a different kind of a climate environment, the same picture, and maybe you have snow instead of uh, sunshine. Uh, and then a, a, a third kind of a picture, which is completely synthetic. It, it started off with a text prompt and ended up with an image. You can use any of the diffusion models for that. The ability to distinguish between um, original content versus augmented content versus synthetic content is available to us as Qualcomm because that's where the content is created to begin with, in the device. And so we are working with our partners in that space to make sure that they are in a position to provide that certificate of authenticity. And that's like the transparency associated with AI. Once again, uh, this is, nothing is lost in translation over here. The, de the device was the one that created the content to begin with and right at that origin, we know exactly how it was created and there's a certain level of assurance that now it's completely transparent. Uh, these are two initiatives which I think 
will help address any concerns that anyone has, but also probably what we are beginning to see is that users are very happy with the fact that, oh, this is awesome, we can run this on device. Well, you, you, and I want to go back to something you just said, because what's really interesting, there's been studies done that less than 10% of the population in the United States are actually using tools like ChatGPT. When you're in the technology space like I am or you are, we tend to think, well, everybody's using ChatGPT, and it really hasn't gone mainstream yet. So, you know, once, uh, technology's only been used 7% of the population. That's not mainstream. It's got to get to 50, 60, 70% where it becomes ubiquitous. And I think to your point, you know, consumers, especially end users, enterprise customers, are, 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 you know, they have IT groups and they have they're, they study this stuff quite uh, closely, and uh, they're prepared for the the things that they need to do to make sure that data is secured. But you're absolutely right. If you're going to want to, if you want to want uh, that local experience of data that's collected in your smartphone, for example, and your and your laptop and other devices you may use, that's a really high threshold of trust. Mm -hmm. So I'm very impressed with the fact that Qualcomm. Well, first of all, they've, they've recognized that, and number two, this is not a new topic. You guys have been talking about this for some time. Yes, we have. And in hey, folks, this is Mark Vina, CEO of Smart Tech Research. Smart Tech Research is proud to have Aura sponsoring my Smart Tech Check podcast. Aura security software is the all-in-one digital safety net for the whole family. It's literally like having a personal cyber guardian that protects all of the devices in your home on a 24 by 7 basis. What's more, its AI functionality stands out as it constantly learns and adapts to threats, keeping your family and you safe around the clock. It's a must-have solution for anyone serious about online security. Stay tuned for a special no-obligation promo offer for Aura that will give you cybersecurity peace of mind. Hi, I'm Anna with Smart Tech Research. Whether you're browsing the web, checking emails, monitoring your children's online behavior, spam calls and identity protection, and conducting online transactions, Aura has your back, ensuring a secure and seamless experience every time. Aura's comprehensive security solutions are compatible with Microsoft Windows, Apple Mac OS, Android, iOS, and iPad OS devices. For an exclusive 14-day no-obligation trial version of Aura, use the on-screen QR code or visit the website shown here. Aura is the smart, simple way to stay safe online. In fact, the fact that we can run this locally on the device without, uh, you know, worrying about, uh, like, if you take a look at a chatbot, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, <clears throat> today's smaller models, and when I say small, they're not, they're still very large, but they're not like trillions of parameters, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of 10 billion parameters as an example. These models are far more sophisticated compared to last year's models, which, which were probably about 70 billion, which in turn were far more sophisticated than the year before. So the fact that we can pack in a lot of power into these smaller models and still be able to uh, extract exactly the same kind of a user experience that one would have expected one or two years back from without any from latency, right. part, with zero latency issues, the immediacy is perfect. That is clearly uh, uh, something that most users can resonate with. Now, what's fascinating is we just got uh, got bust over here from after seeing some really fascinating demos. I, that could be another three-hour podcast for me to talk <laughs> about all the demos we saw, but I was impressed. In the Copilot Plus area, they were uh, that you had a number of partners. McAfee was there uh, that are really focused on this whole thing about how do we how do we leverage the technology that's present in uh, the new Snapdragon X Elite um, uh, uh, solutions and use that capability to help identify deep fakes. A lot of the stuff is first step stuff, um, mm -hmm. first step I think. And uh, but let's talk a little bit about the partner relationship and the, why that's so critical. Like, you know, Qualcomm obviously is accepting a lot of responsibility for this and are putting steps in place, but talk about the, the power of Qualcomm and its engagement with partners like McAfee and others to help you know, really get people over the hump in terms of, hey, you know what, we're trying to do our very best to make sure that content is identifiable as potentially um, misleading. So, uh, us working with uh, uh, the, the software vendor ecosystem, the ISVs and the likes of McAfee, actually it's kind of a very important initiative mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we want everyone in the software ecosystem, especially those uh, who, who provide a lot of the tools, whether it's security tools, security services, or uh, other instances, productivity tools, for them to fully understand the capabilities of the technology 
make sure that they actually not just understand but also trust it enough to say you know what i can now run this own device and mm -hmm. fully embrace it bottom line we are in the business of providing a platform on which services can be built we want to make it very easy for service providers to actually use our platform so there's an initiative just associated with that but in this entire outreach we want to make sure that they fully understand the benefits so they become the advocates of those benefits to the end consumers uh, as well and in this entire equation especially when it comes to pcs i mean microsoft has been an incredible partner for mm -hmm. us uh, in terms of the way that we actually worked in bringing uh, ai pcs uh, uh, to to the commercial sector give me a little flavor in the in the few minutes we have left when you put your prognostication hat on when you look a couple of years down the road where do you think this is all going um, in terms of privacy, security? Obviously, Qualcomm is going to continue to make huge investments in this category. And, and you know, you talk about 45 tops, you know, th that will be a, probably a modest number <laughs> three years from now. We'll look at that with fondness. Oh, remember those days when we had, we had chips that could do 45 tops. But, the, 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 I, and I'm not so much, the performance is going to be there. But when you look at the industry and you look at the market, where mm -hmm. do you think Qualcomm will put, be putting its weight against to make sure that AI becomes a, a mainstream application? Again, I, I'm not too much worried about the enterprise because enterprise customers have, you know, have lots of smart guys and you are already working very closely with them. But to get that 7% figure to 60, 70, 80% over the next two or three years, years, which I think is possible, but I'd like to get you know, your, your view of that. Okay. So uh, I'm going to actually not talk too much about the technology trajectory, which you should expect it to improve year over year quite significantly, yes. just based on what we did this year compared to last year. But uh, let me actually touch upon two points, which I think are important. One is uh, when we talk of uh, democratizing the access of AI to all kinds of devices, we do think of it as a worldwide phenomenon. This mm. is not something that is only in the US or only in Europe or in China, but in every single place in the world, which means one of the things that one should expect, and you're already beginning to see that, is that the large generative AI models are no longer just from one or two countries. They're coming in from all countries. Geographies, right. Every different region has its own set of initiatives. There mm -hmm. are uh, large models from countries in Europe, uh, from the Middle East, uh, from Asia, and that pattern will continue, which means there is a whole lot of diversity of models that come in, all kinds of languages, different kinds of modalities, uh, and so that is a trend line that is here to stay. That, that much is clear. And from Qualcomm perspective, we are making sure that all of these models, every single, I think, our mission is to make sure every single generative AI model on the planet can actually run on our devices to the extent that we can, uh, depending on the size and exactly what is needed from it. So that's like one trend line. Mm -hmm. That's here to stay for sure. <clears throat> the other trend line is uh, what started off in PCs with... Uh, the notion of a pervasive AI. Uh, in other words, it's not reactive but proactive computing where AI is kind of constantly running in the background. It's not just a chatbot. It's not something that you ask a question and you get a response all the time. But it is something that's constantly running in background. What started in PCs, we do anticipate that that desire to have that kind of a user experience all the time in other kinds of devices as well, uh, eventually into smartphones, in IoT devices, both consumer and industrial IoT applications, uh, not to mention uh, XR glasses uh, as we get to it. And these are two, uh, you know, we can see glimpses of these trend lines already, but this is something that we anticipate as we move forward. No, I agree with that. And the only thing I, the, the only thing I would close on this is this, I just bought a brand new home and uh, it's a, a, it was a townhome, a fully, it was built as a fully smart technology okay. developed home. I can assure you, <laughs> as someone who knows a little bit about technology and set things up, what I look for from an AI perspective is the ability to handle multiple requests, to make recommendations about setup and configuration, because right now, and that's just one area, by the way, mm -hmm. but, but I'm just kind of facing this right now, and I, I suspect Qualcomm is going to play a very heavy role with that in terms of making the smart home really smart. I surely hope so. <laughs> so listen, thank you for your time. I appreciate thank it. You once and again. Uh, thank you again for giving us a little bit of glimpse into the thinking at uh, Qualcomm. Thanks for having me. All thank right. you again. Nice to see you. Bye.